In Shona traditional language, we say the axe that cuts the tree is the one that forgets, but not the tree that was cut. I believe to truly understand the current racial dynamics in America, you have to know its black history. In the department, black literature is often criticized as being too political to be considered as real literature. But can you really blame them though? How can you write about wizards, knights, and chivalry when you can't breathe because the system literally has a knee on your neck? There are things you may think you understand about African American culture, but really don't. For example, that controversial use of the N-word. I personally used to use the N-word liberally because I obviously listened to a lot of hip-hop and thought it was so cool, you know? But after I did African American literature back in college and understanding the true history behind that word, I am now very reserved about when I use the N-word and this brief documentary will partly explain why. It is important to know this rather tragic history as documented in the literature of the black victims who fought against the horrific slavery and racial segregation on the ground. It should be known so one can avoid saying such ignorant things like this. When you hear about slavery for 400 years, for 400 years, that sounds like a choice. Like, you was there for 400 years and it's all of y'all? Yes, way before Twitter or oh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. These groundbreaking writers such as Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, Zora New Hurston, Maya Angelou, Tony Morrison, and even Tupac Shakur, among many others, became significant, important voices of their generations that spread awareness on the suffering of their brothers and sisters, as well as restoring a lost African culture with their rich in art. Hence, let me welcome you to this special two-part recollection of the African-American struggle as Mimsy Africa presents the history of African American literature. Part 1 Black, or as they call it these days, African American literature is literature written by people of African descent who came to North America mostly by their ancestors who were abducted into slavery from the 17th century. It's almost impossible to separate African American literature from American history because most of their literature then, poems, plays, and novels were based on the negative things black Americans endured in racist America. So you will find this video there will be a lot of cross-referencing to actual American history just to give you a clearer context of where these authors were coming from. That is why the video had to be long enough to be divided into two parts because there are just too many things we just you just cannot leave out. So, again, where it all really began was in the 17th century when the Africans were violently abducted from Africa in chains to work in America as slaves against their will by the white Americans. As soon as they reached these foreign lands, the ultimate savagery took place. They were bred like animals to earth. Okay. You know, this is just too depressing. You know what? With the media coverage surrounding slavery, I think it's safe to assume you know what went down on those plantations in this day and age. If you still insist that you don't, I highly recommend you watch Kofi as a Slave. Although I can promise you that watching that movie will be a walk in the park, but it will definitely give you a rough idea. <sighs> you will strike her. He will strike her until her flesh is rent and meat and blood flow equal. I will kill every nigger in my sight. You understand me? Strike her! Strike her! They had their culture and humanity completely stripped so they could become livestock, you know, just like property. Their real names and identity became less than this animalistic word invented for them called, um, <clears throat> you're gonna have to excuse my language here. Niggas. But deep down, most of these slavers always knew that these quote savages were as human as them and what they were doing was wrong. After all, what kind of twisted farmer rapes his own domesticated livestock, right? If if they really were animals as they used to say, right? But knowing this would be too economically inconvenient 
They desperately tried to prevent slaves from claiming this humanity and tried to justify this bondage by their own literature. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. That nigga that don't obey his Lord, that's his master, do you see? That there nigga shall be beaten with many stripes. That's scripture. In the midst of this slavery, it was critical for slaves to remain completely illiterate and uneducated. To prevent the slaves from questioning the system, realizing the ghastly inhumanity of their bondage and enlightening the rest of the world about it. That is why slaves who could even just read or write were considered dangerous and usually executed upon discovery. If you want to survive, do and say as little as possible. Tell no one who you really are and tell no one you can read and write. Unless you want to be a dead nigga. And the sad thing is, for a while it really did work. Most of the slaves really did believe they were just foreign creatures incapable of culture, communication or language like their white captors. For a very long time the bitter blooded voices of the slaves had no real solid way to communicate and assemble against their oppressors. However, Senegalese born poet in Massachusetts, Code Phyllis Wheatley became one of the earliest African Americans to publish a book and gained the first noteworthy reputation as a writer when she published a poetic anthology, poems on various subjects, religious and moral, in 1773. Her poetry was praised by many of the leading white figures of the American Revolution, including George Washington, who loved her work so much they couldn't believe that she wrote it. No, like literally they actually dragged their ass to court so she could prove that she actually did write that sophisticated poetry. Although not directly attacking the slavery system itself, it was a very unsettling black milestone for the white slave owners because Whitley's writing saved as early evidence that their slaves were actually capable of sophisticated language and communication. It was a really depressing time and the few literary slaves who could write dealt with their issues in two main genres. Some slaves like Zilfa Allo wrote about spiritualism and religion which was known as the spiritual narrative but as the consciousness of the slaves evolved they began to realize just how unjust and hypocritical the Christianity of the system was. As ironic as it was, the most brutal slave owners were usually the most religious. And the Lord said the fear of ye and the dread of ye shall be on every beast of the earth. Most slaves began to really long for their physical freedom from the 19th century. This is where the abolishment movement really gained momentum. Following the slave narrative footsteps of Nigerian Olawuda Ikuyano from the previous century, among the strongest literal responses against slavery came from Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Jacobs, The Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, narrative of William W. Brown, a fugitive slave, the fugitive blacksmith, events in the life of James W. C. Pennington, and of course, arguably the most famous or infamous, The Life of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass published in 1845. And I use the word infamous because the autobiographical contents in these narratives of what these slaves went through were very graphic harrowing, ghastly, and just plain heartbreaking at times. Frederick Douglass' former master, Mr. Ord, believed literacy ruined the greatest slave in the world. Well, Mr. Ord was right, as literacy made Frederick Douglass and many literal folks like him, other abolitionist writers like Sojourner Truth, William Steele, or Josephine Brown, as well as the revolutionary poet Francis Harper. One of the most crucial figures in abolishing slavery itself in America, their written work served as media, awareness and evidence to the rest of the nation on just how ugly slavery was and why it should be abolished immediately. As time went on, because of the progressive activism towards it, 
the northern and southern states of america became divided over their opinions of slavery much of the north began to believe that harshly laboring humans against their will was wrong while the southern states still as rigid as ever still believed well what if i was to say i don't like you or your fancy pants nigga this argument became so heated it led to the infamous american civil war between the north and the south from 1861 later on after four years with the 13th amendment and the slavery abolishment after the south lost the civil war in 1865 came a period of reconstruction this was the time called the reconstruction period because this was the period where blacks and whites would forgive and forget their past move on in racial harmony and hold hands and sing kumbaya right well if you know your history you know this was only written down to look good on paper but not on the ground racism in america was still flying as high as the confederate flag itself perhaps it just took another form the form of the jim crow laws that came to pass from the 1870s that saw black people as quote separate but equal all i can say at least that separate part was true but as for the equality part oh it was just about to get real though free the african americans still were not allowed to vote go to certain schools be seen in certain places work at certain jobs get to live at certain residences or even use certain bathrooms they were basically rightless they basically had no right to do anything this was white america's way of reminding them that even though they are now free now they still and always will be just <clears throat> please you're gonna have to excuse my language again niggas you always read niggas <sighs> and the jim crow laws back this racism and its mentally damaging effects despite this black literature breakthroughs continued to multiply that consolidated the literal sophistication of the people who wrote it and of course confront this newly institutionalized racism the influential poet o lawrence dunbar who often wrote in rural black dialect of the day came to prominence after he published his first book of poetry oak and ivy in 1893 many emerging black scholars late 19th century to early 20th century came with different opinions on how the former slave was supposed to be reintegrated into society the most famous opinions coming from scholars booker t washington w.e.b du bois and jamaican marcus garvey washington gave a controversial address called the atlanta compromise in 1895 advising black americans to sort of wait for their rights to be gradually handed to them by their white oppressors while other scholars like marcus garvey and dubois were like no way jose screw them crackers we got to take that immediately w.e.b dubois believed african americans were supposed to fight back segregation and not wait for gradual desegregation as Booker T. Washington had suggested back in 1895. Understanding the serious psychological impact of slavery and racial intolerance on black people, he wrote the acclaimed psychoanalytic 1903 classic, The Soul of Black Folk. This book explained and shed light on the many subconscious inferiority complexes many blacks carried away from slavery, racism, and the Jim Crow laws in America. The soul of the black folk argues because of this barbaric racism, many African Americans developed what he called the double consciousness, whereby black people are forced to act differently from their real selves as individuals, but black stereotypical mammies or Uncle Toms just to receive white social approval. This was true as many blacks at the time looked at themselves with self-hatred and shame and wanted to be more like the white American. They wanted that social approval they ironically did not get anyway despite literally burning their hair and skin to get it. This is when the enigmatic Jamaican son of the soil, Marcus Garvey, came to New York with these revolutionary ideas of black self-acceptance, love, pride, and solidarity. Garvey with his founding of the UNIA 
and later Negro World newspaper which urged Africans everywhere not to run away from themselves, not to envy the white skin, blonde, straight hair, blue eyes, skinny asses and embrace their natural dark selves as well as their background and cultures. With this nationalism and before the Harlem Renaissance and the Negritude movement, Gavi may have been the first hero who truly breathed life into the phrase Black is beautiful. But the South was still as unrepentantly racist as ever. They were still convinced black people were still the same animals they once kept and treated them accordingly. The South was indeed a dreaded place to be black in the early 20th century. You have to understand how abhorrent segregation was in the Deep South. Segregation was so bad back then, my rule was if it was in the South, it wasn't worth it. And most of my family was in the South, and I didn't care. They were not worth it. That is why such infamous racially charged political groups such as the Ku Klux Klan was formed in 1865 to hold on onto that dated legacy of slavery. From around the times of the First World War, because of this racial intolerance and of course continued violence and lynchings, African Americans that lived in the South found it better to migrate to the northern states of America like New York, New Jersey and Harlem. The states who had fought for their freedom where the racism was less intense there so they could get some sort of a decent life you know. This is where many of them converged in Harlem and formed the historical artistic movement known as the Harlem Renaissance. From the 1920s, the Harlem Renaissance was like the first real major safe space away from the hatred where black people could find themselves, share their stories, explore their identities, restore and reinvent their artistic heritage. With such legendary artists like James Weldon Johnson, Eugene Toomer, Claude McKay, Quincy Cullen, Wallace Thurman and many more. These then young artists resurrected and celebrated their blackness by creating awesome poetry, music, dance, art and literature. Amongst the most renowned writers of the Renaissance was poet Langston Hughes, who was known for his simplistic black folk groovy style of wordplay in his very relatable jazzy poetry with such few good lines like, folks, I'm telling you, birthing is hard and dying is me, so go against yourself a little loving in between. He truly made his name in such poems like Harlem, Dream Boogie, Let America Be America Again or the famous The Negro Speaks of Rivers inspired by the Mississippi and rivers back in Africa such as the Nile or the Congo River back in the DRC. I built my hut near the Congo and it allowed me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. Another great writer of Harlem was Zora Neale Hurston who wrote the novel Their Eyes Were Watching God, a novel lauded by scholars for its textured portrayal of the fictional life of a black woman called Jenny Crawford and her battle against a misogynistic society that is even made worse by the legacy of slavery. Zora also boasts work which included 14 books that included anthropology, short stories and novel length fiction. By the time the Harlem Renaissance concluded in the mid 1930s, it had already established itself as a landmark redefining period in African American literature, culture and even pride because before this time, Books by African Americans were mainly read by other black people. But after this period is where the black arts began making a real impact into American mainstream culture. But still, the struggle against segregation was far from being over. Others we discussed in this video are the ones who set the foundation for, for the writers to come for the rest of the century. So tune in again when Mimsy Africa delves into this new generation of writers like Lauren Hansberry, Alice Walker and Toni Morrison who carried the torch to the civil rights era and beyond in our second and final part of the history of African American literature post Harlem Renaissance. So see y'all then, and as always, thanks for watching. You.
thanks again for watching the video super grateful guys Mimsy Africa is a new pan-African media brand dedicated to enlightening y'all on that rich African literature, historical, artistic, cultural heritage in our awesome, modern, relevant social media kind of way. We are always in the process of creating fresh, new, quirky, Afrocentric videos like these. So if you want to keep updated on our latest content, don't hesitate to follow our online pages on these major social media platforms, which you can learn quite a lot from too. And of course, if you like what you saw and want to see more, please, for the love of the motherland, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time. Peace.